the, the, the University of Helsinki's Africa Day webinar focusing on Africa and geopolitics. There are people joining us, so we begin slowly to start this webinar as people are coming in. Just wanted to wish you all happy Africa Day, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of our panelists and all of our participants. My name is Anna-Maria Salmi, and I work as Head of Development at the University of Helsinki International Affairs, also responsible for our university's Africa program. So we have big ambitious goals of uh, increasing and strengthening our partnerships with different African institutions. So very happy to have you all on board here. And are we now ready to kick off? Are our panelists ready? They, they look to be very ready indeed. So a warm welcome to Lisa Laakso, Rista Marjuma and Ajongwe, Akonwe Ajongwe today. Let's start with our first speaker, Lisa Laakso. I'm sure Lisa is very familiar to most of you. Lisa Laakso is a senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden, an expert on world politics and international development cooperation with research interests include political science, African studies, democratization of Africa, world politics, crisis management, EU Africa policy, etc. So Lisa is also, for instance, the chair of the board of Finnish development NGOs, FINGO, and has close collaboration and a lot of ties to the Uni University of Helsinki as well. So very happy to have you, Lisa, on board. So let's start with you. Lisa, let's imagine this webinar would only last for two minutes only. What would be your key message when you think of Africa and geopolitics and the changing world? Please, Lisa, you can unmute yourself and start speaking. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, panel. Uh, indeed, I think that uh, what is important to understand at the moment is the view how we see Africa and the kind of uh, respect we are giving to African uh, leaders and uh, researchers, academia, uh, civil society. Uh, there is a lot of talk about colonialism and the burden of colonialism and decolonization. I think that what is particularly relevant for us in Finland and in the Nordic countries is that Although we might not have the burden of colonialism, we have the burden of development assistance, not in the sense of the content of development cooperation and its results, but the kind of mentality behind it, where we see Africa as uh, underdeveloped and ourselves as developed. We see Africa as a child <laughs> that has to develop I mean, in its, in its extreme. So this idea of uh, developed and developing is a power relation. And uh, I would challenge us to think that uh, we really need to go forward uh, with the framework of partnership. There is a lot of talk about partnership, but uh, it's not yet in the implementation. We should understand that uh, researchers in Africa are sometimes publishing in better journals than we are, that there are talented young people. They have access to data and material we do not have access to. So we, we have to keep this uh, 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 equality and partnership in the, in the agenda and implement it seriously. Wonderful, thank you. What a great beginning. So let's get back to the power relations and, and giving voice to, to African voices in this webinar. We want to make sure. So remind us, Lisa, about that if, if, we, if we forget that we get back to this. Now, I would like to give the floor next to Rista Marjama, who is a university lecturer at the University of Helsinki. Um, he has previously also worked in a number of 
positions, including the Professor for African Studies at the University of Helsinki, and his special fields are the history of Africa, globalization, world history, and the history of wars and conflicts. And maybe if you don't mind, I would like to advertise this wonderful new book for those who read Finnish, Epävarmuuksien aika, Tiedekulman pokkari. There's a great article by Risto there that has just today come out also as, as a podcast, so you can actually also listen to that. So Risto, now the floor is yours. Two minutes to go. What would be the thing you would want our audience to remember? Okay, thank you. Um, university lecturer, yes, university lecturer in, in history. History is my, my uh, yes. major now. Lisa kind of robbed me of my main theme, which is post-colonialism, but I will put, in, 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 uh, put that into a historian's perspective. It's been now 60 years since most of the Sub-Saharan African countries uh, got their independence for, from the colonial powers. 60 years is a very long time, even for a historian. 60 years to me would seem to point that our current system is not working and it's not going to work. I think there is a fundamental flaw in the idea of development. If it would have worked, it would have worked already. 60 years is about two or three generations. We should see the results already by now. And I think this is the kind of a main theme in our time that now Africans and Africa is trying to seek for other kind of solutions than Western model of, of development. And that's about it. Less than two minutes. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that was very efficient indeed. Great. So, so partly tied to what Lisa was already saying, that we really need to focus on, on the concept of development also very critically here. And I'm sure what, what Dr. Akonwi Ayonge will say also will relate to that, I think. So please let me introduce our third speaker, who is Dr. Akonwi Ayonke, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki in the International Forest Policy Research Group at the Faculty of Agriculture and Forestry. And he works with Project Green Pole that pursues interdisciplinary assessments of forest policy outcomes. So this will be also very interesting to hear about uh, more he is interested in the anthropology of research management systems for protected forests, especially in West Africa. And he's also been very active in the HELSUS of the University of Helsinki. He's the co-editor of the HELSUS Global South Encounters platform. So with these words, the next two minutes go to you, Ayunge. So what would be the key thing you would want our audience to, to remember from this webinar? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. I think uh, we have long talked about colonialism and we are pretty much uh, still at that uh, point of looking at these different polarizations that sort of like have been rooted from colonial systems of governments and uh, we still have a little bit of problems left over in Africa. Um, I think we are now at the point where a lot of global issues impact on Africa even more directly, and forestry is a pretty much a good example. So um, it will be interesting to discuss uh, other ways of thinking about forestry in general. What is Africa's role? Um, Africa has um, a number of agreements uh, through the African Union and uh, commitments uh, into broader discourse and uh, proposals and agreements on climate, for instance, energy and so on. Uh, we have seen through the past couple of years, a um, number of schemes, uh, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, all the way to the Paris Agreement and so on and so forth. And uh, now we talk a lot about the Great Deal. Uh, what has Africa got to offer on the table? So these are certain questions, rising things to this course. So I look forward to share some ideas on this. Thank you. Yes, thank you so very much. 
And thank you for bringing the ecological viewpoint here. We need to look not only at conflicts, but also the climate and the interconnections, the ramifications impact. So, so look forward to a very interesting discussion here. Now, had we had this webinar, let's say 10 years ago, it would have probably looked a little bit different, of course, from our point of view and looking at the situation here in Finland, of course, Russia's war in Ukraine has dramatically changed the picture. So, so let's start, start with that, how that changed things here in Europe, but maybe also in Africa. So maybe we start with Risto, if you are ready. Risto, I know, and you look uh, at the thing from a historian's perspective. For a long time already, Russia has been active and the Soviet Union before that in, in Africa. Would you tell a little bit of, about Russia's role in, in Africa at the moment, how you see it? A little bit. Mm, okay. Yes. <laughs> very briefly, we yeah, have to lots put, of topics and lots of interesting things. To put it very briefly, from the Russian point of view, uh, it's about regaining areas of uh, spheres of influence they had, uh, or their predecessor Soviet Union had on African continent. Africa is one of the few places in the world where Russians see room to expand their own influence, because um, it is still a continent where you have much conflicts, many conflicts. Russia doesn't have that much to offer from the economic point of view, but it can offer military power uh, very, um, what's the word, um, very unrestrained use of military power uh, for those who can pay for it. And they have been very clever in using um, private companies like Wagner in sending military help, let's say to a local um, government in an African country, and then to get economic uh, treaties in compensation for that. And they have been able to uh, create a large sphere of especially mineral uh, mineral interests, mainly in, in Central Africa, but now also in, increasingly in, in Western Africa, usually in countries where, which are very poor and in the throes of, of conflicts. And that's about it in nutshell. Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. Thanks, Risto. Yes, Russia is the big military power. We all know that China is, is the big economic power and let's, let's move to that a little bit later. But, but maybe Lisa, if you can comment, I mean, Risto mentioned that, that there's room for Russia. So how is that and what's the role of the e European Union, for instance? Why, why is there so much room for Russia to, to intervene? Yes, I think that from the African perspective, it might be so that uh, Russia as such is not so important, but uh, much of the reactions are also criticism uh, towards the West and also European Union. Now, I, I would say that the, both the US and the European Union, although they are the most important partners with Africa, their interest in the continent has been sporadic and, uh, and uh, short-term interests in a way that, uh, for instance, if we think of, about Arab Spring and what happened in North Africa, there were massive involvements. I'm now thinking about Libya. And uh, the consequences have been quite dramatic. Libya is now divided. Uh, it's uh, more or less collapse caused uh, huge, huge problems in the whole Sahel area. And we are now seeing the consequences in the instability in the area. And uh, France has not really been able to bring order. So there has been disappointments and criticism and serious security uh, problems. So, so uh, that's why the kind of uh, support for Russian involvement that you can see can be also interpreted as a criticism towards West. And this concerns also the whole African approach to the war in Ukraine. Um, Although, I mean, there has been great variation among African countries, but the fact that many African countries did not vote along uh, the West 
was not so much against Ukraine and Ukrainian interests, but more a kind of uh, criticism uh, towards the unipolar world system and the hegemony of uh, of the US and um, and Europe who have not really, I would come back to my first point, maybe not really respected Africa as an equal partner. Yes, well, that's a very, very interesting point indeed. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the impact of colonialism in these interpretations. You already hinted towards that, but, but maybe before we go into that, how do you see this, Ayonge? Does it, uh, do you agree with the claims that have been put forward by Risto and Lisa? Pretty much, there has been uh, questions about the uh, Russia's position in Africa. Uh, there has also been critics on military intervention and so on. But uh, there's a lot more to probably unpack. Uh, there has been long time uh, instability in Sub-Saharan Africa. There has been the Boko Haram crisis, aspects pretty much linked to religious uh, uh, conflicts. There have been other forms of conflict linked to land use and so on. This has long been in the continent, even though not much spoken about in the media. Um, mm -hmm. Russia's position would probably be that of uh, but it, of course, it is up to African governments uh, in terms of uh, uh, geopolitical security, military assistance, uh, other forms of cooperation on how to bring about peace. Um, I think that would be one area uh, for governments to think more about um, at the moment in terms of uh, military equipment. So uh, that is something that uh, investments can be pursued in that area. And uh, think more about peace. We have been long talking about um, conflicts and critics and so on, but this is the time where they need to be more of cooperation and partnership and so on for progress. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and towards the end of the seminar, we are moving more towards African voices, African perspectives, but let's talk a little bit more about the big players like Russia, China, uh, US, and, and the European Union. Um, but I totally agree with you that we also need more nuanced pictures of, of the different circumstances in, in different African countries. So that's a very, very valid point indeed. Let's talk a little bit about colonialism and the impact of, of how African countries are, are looking at the war in Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> due to that, uh, Risto, is there something you would want to want to say here about this? Concerning which one? The colonialism or Ukraine? Yes, the colonialism perspective, how it impacts. Lisa already began uh, talking about that. Is there something you would want to add to what Lisa was just saying previously? Well, mainly the point I would like to make is that from the point of view of African countries, especially Sub-Saharan African countries, post-colonialism in a way means a position from which they want to get out of. Mm -hmm. And because the system is kind of structural in our modern world, world system, and the West is the main force behind our modern world system, so from the African point of view, the West is more part of the problem than part of the solution. Russia is not a solution either, because as noted, Russia uh, thrives in conflicts. They take part in conflicts and try to improve their position there. So I think that from the African point of view, perhaps the most interesting development in our modern times is with China. And thus, not that much, um, that, and that gives them little incentive to take strong point in the, in the Ukrainian war because, well, China doesn't want that, but it's not really in the interest of the African countries themselves. I don't really see what, how it would benefit the African countries themselves to take a stronger um, 
pro-Western view on the Ukrainian war. Okay, that's a very, very good point indeed. So let's move over to China and then let's come back still with the consequences of the war because I want to hear your, your thoughts on, on, on that because of course it has had uh, lots of major and very concrete impacts uh, on the African continent. But, but China, yes, I think there's no rival to China in terms of of economical engagement in, in Africa, at least in my understanding, China is the largest trading partner of African countries. It's it's a big source of, of in, infrastructure investment in particular. So uh, maybe we start with Lisa. Lisa, how do you see China's role in, in, in Africa at the moment? And has it been changing now recently? Or what's your take on that? Yes, indeed, uh, China is a big player, but if you if we compare it to Europe, European Union and member states, Europe is still more important partner, but as a country, of course, it is important. And, uh, and But also it's uh, good to remember that uh, there is variation between African countries. So in some countries, China is heavily present. In some countries, it is hardly visible. But uh, but indeed, it's uh, it's very uh, it's very strong player, and uh, one area where you can see China's uh, presence is also cultural influence and the cultural institutes it has established in all African countries. Uh, now they exist. Um, what is important for China is still stability, and its interests are not necessarily the same as the Russian interests. And uh, and indeed, one could maybe say that um, that uh, Russia needs more Africa than Africa needs Russia. But with China, the situation is such that uh, that uh, China benefits of Africa and needs it, but also Africa needs China. And infrastructure is uh, is one area. Uh, a big difference between China as a partner to African countries when you compare to Europe is that it is a one-party state and very strong uh, governance, which means that when Chinese delegates and uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs comes to Africa, he can make deals and, uh, and, and China can simultaneously <laughs> make uh, cultural cooperation, can agree about infrastructure, and can guarantee loans from a bank. Uh, whereas uh, when Europeans go, it's uh, multiple players, different companies, uh, then you have to get involved with, uh, with um, loan systems. So China is a strong uh, partner in a way that, uh, that it is, uh, it is a one-party state and uh, centrally uh, 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 ruled state. And, and that is why it is a bit challenging for European players because uh, China can easily dump the prices. It can easily get a monopoly in, uh, in one mining sector, for instance. Uh, so the rules are a little bit different, but this then relates also to the World Trade Organization and uh, rule-based uh, international order. Exactly. Now, thank you, Lisa. I have two follow-up questions to what you just said, if, if you don't mind. You mentioned first that, that China is very strong in some countries, not very strong or not present even in some other countries. And that's interesting because I think we oftentimes talk of China's influence in Africa as it would have like total influence everywhere. So what do you think explains this, that China has been able to, to have a lot of room in some countries and not in some others? Is it more due to China's own interests or has it to do with the African countries themselves? I think it is both, but, uh, but of course the raw materials are a key here and the resources. So like uh, DRC Congo, uh, I think that the president is just now visiting China, and uh, and that's uh, that's uh, one of the largest uh, producers of uh, critical minerals for the green uh, transition. So that can that kind of countries, whereas there are smaller African countries where 
China does not have so much economic interests, but also yeah. China has security interests. So one issue that is interesting to follow are the uh, other port uh, uh, projects and uh, military bases. Uh, China is also planning to establish uh, on the coast of, uh, of Africa. Okay, thank you. There are millions of things I would like to ask you more, but maybe just the other one. So you mentioned that that EU is not as visible due to many, many reasons. If you were, were to advise on uh, about how the EU should make maybe a stronger and coherent kind of, uh, well, let's, uh, maybe not impact is not the word, but but presence in, in, in Africa or African countries, what would your advice be? Is there anything to be done? to combat this China's like, you know, one man, <laughs> one man <laughs> approach and opportunity. Well, maybe visibility is an interesting example because it could be reached quite uh, cheaply. If you now travel in, in African countries, you can easily see Chinese presence and uh, China mentioned here and there. EU, European Union is mm -hmm. not so, you can't see it. I mean, the member states, uh, France, uh, maybe Germany, previously Britain, are uh, much uh, more recognized uh, players. So the European Union really does not have the profile it could have as a partner with Africa. Okay, good, thanks. So you mentioned these are raw materials. So let's now move, move to that a little bit, maybe from, from the Chinese perspective, but also on a broader scale. So Ayong, you are specialists on forests, which is of course a very important raw material maybe as well. Um, what would your take be here? Um, what is the role of, of raw materials and, and this kind of issues in, in this geopolitical rivalry? So please, Ayong, the floor is yours. Yeah, I completely agree that um, China's uh, presence in Africa, it really differs for each of the African countries, and it's the same for uh, for the EU. But um, in terms of uh, within the forestry sector, I think one really pulling factor is that of raw materials. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, pretty much um, a fertile uh, area for uh, the growing of cash crops, what we, uh, in other ways, um, we might call uh, rubber, uh, uh, cocoa, used for producing uh, chocolate, and uh, also palm, palm oil from the palm woods. Uh, those are really good examples. But also, um, uh, also uh, it's also a pulling factor of the uh, renewable energy, uh, solar energy and uh, hydropower. Um, I think for the EU, there has been, um, there has been some uh, kind of a cooperation that was in uh, 2020 between the African Union and the uh, European Union based on the green transition. So um, I think uh, we would be seeing probably more and more projects in this area in the coming years. But the question is whether Africa uh, needs these different powers uh, more than the powers need Africa. Yeah. So again, again, this would be a thing, matter of the African governments, how they negotiate this. Uh, China has been really sort of like taking more ground when it comes to loans. Uh, uh, we hear about imperialism and a lot of this countries that have been from the colonial era are now looking more and more into other sources of getting loans for development and so on. But the question of how to negotiate these loans is pretty much a difficult thing, something that has to be addressed. Okay, thank you, Ayonga. Very very good points and and who needs whom more and when is of course one of the crucial things as also focus on on world systems and and agreements and and contracts and and the frame of inequality maybe we have time to talk about that as well but maybe we focus a little bit more on on the 
on some very concrete things now and let's get back to to the war in Ukraine and the impact it had ha it has had on the African continent something that was talked a lot about I think maybe a year ago but something that maybe is not that much talked at least not in the Finnish media now so so I wonder why that is also so so maybe we start with Risto I mean we know that that the grain issue and the problem of malnutrition rising prices of food was an issue at least a year ago um how is the situation now is is there an impact due to the war uh, on this well uh, first of all i would like to shortly comment on on the division of interest in in uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, from from the chinese part i think there is also a kind of an understanding between china and russia that they have a division of sphere of interest somehow because they do not seem to conflict anywhere in africa okay, it's always the west which conflicts with either china or or the russians but they don't conflict each other so they seem to have this kind of division um, yes, I think it's going to be an issue uh, in this summer as well. Um, the system of allowing both Ukrainian and Russian uh, uh, foodstuffs to be exported has worked remarkably well. In fact, I don't recall any other case in history in which you would have been able to sustainably have a kind of a free trade agreement between warring powers during a war. It's a very spectacular achievement and probably due to the fact that both sides uh, want to avoid having the blame for uh, causing um, distress, especially in, in Near East and uh, Middle East and, and, and Africa. But as long as this deal stands, the situation perhaps is not going to be worse than it already is, because it has worked now almost a year, 10 months or so. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and a striking example. Lisa, do you agree with that, what Risto just said? And let's then move over also to talking about energy prices. But Lisa, maybe you comment on, on Risto's. Uh, talk yes uh, i i think that but uh, even though the war has uh, in a way highlighted africa's uh, position in international politics uh, it's not really a playground for the warring parties or not really a playground for for china and uh, and, and and russia so uh, so in that respect uh, what rista said indeed is uh, is a valid point and and what be behind the screens i think that uh, china's influence uh, is remarkable for how african countries are are relating to russia and ukraine also so so um, the fact that uh, Zelensky has now built relations with African leaders is also important in, in this regard. I, I don't think that there has been any conflicts or disagreements between Ukrainians and Africans. I haven't seen in yeah. even in African social media any accusations of Nazism in Ukraine, for instance. That that has not been the case. Yes, when, when, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the energy prices. So we know that has been a huge issue here in, in Europe. How has it been in, in Africa? And do you think, I mean, there are increasing costs of living, I'm sure, due to that? Or are there in African countries, are there any winners out of this? Some African powers may be becoming stronger due to the situation. How would you see it, Lisa? Um, there are winners and losers. I mean, some African countries are... Um, um, oil producers and others are dependent on uh, on uh, oil uh, import. But uh, but what the crisis has highlighted is that uh, how dependent the African countries are on individual raw materials, whether as buyers or, or sellers. And yeah. 
but also when we think of the potential of Africa, I think that it has been quite eye-opening and dramatic to see how dependent Africa is on, on energy or, or some societies, how dependent they are on food produced uh, outside of Africa, when we know that all the resources are on the continent. So this, is, this has maybe been an, an eye-opening for international community. Oh, interesting. Ayonke, is there anything to add to that? And maybe we can also talk a little bit about the kind of interconnections between wars, conflicts, and not only in Ukraine, but, but also in, in Africa and the instability in, in some countries and the environment. And you are a specialist on forests. So how does it look from that point of view? Because we know that the environment is of, often the first victim of of any war. So what is your take on about this? Yeah, um, I would say the events that have happened in Ukraine over the years, um, in a way, has been a source of inspiration for many African countries. Uh, Ukraine has long been exporting grains, really useful for countries in Africa that are probably facing climate issues and need some of these crops being imported. But now you have this there is some kind of a, uh, a need for African countries to be more um, independent on how they get to produce agricultural products for themselves. But um, the other thing that really concerns here are some of those uh, systems that have long been in Africa through the colonial period. And now, of course, they are taking other forms, whether we're talking of participatory governance or collaborative management and so on, because now you get to see many of um, uh, indigenous lands being converted for protected areas, and that also brings into some kind of questions over land rights. So these are some of the things happening and uh, landscapes being converted for producing crops and so on. Um, I think there is a need for another perspective on how to go about this, how to balance needs of conserving forests, conserving wildlife, but also making it available for people's livelihoods to thrive on. So this has been some of the friendly questions now ongoing in Africa. But overall, I think the Ukraine crisis has been an inspiration for some African countries. Okay, that's a very, very interesting viewpoint indeed. So let's move over to African perspectives like within two minutes, but but maybe we need to talk a little bit about the United States as well. So, so what has been the role of the United States recently? Uh, Risto, your take on, on this. Well, if we are dealing with sub-Saharan Africa, the United States has from the Cold War times kind of relegated it to its allies, uh, and mainly France, especially in uh, the West and, and Middle Africa. And this seems to hold. The United States is now kind of uh, retreating from its global, um, global sphere, and it certainly is not wanting to increase its uh, role in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is as always regarded as, as secondary to its own interests. Yeah. And thus, the waning of US interest is mainly perhaps to be seen with the waning of French interest in, in West Africa, especially in, in Mali and Burkina Faso. Okay, interesting. Lisa, do you agree with that? Yeah, that might be the case in, in West Africa where France is so important, but uh, but uh, United States is very important uh, partner, for instance, for South Africa. And uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if, if Ina can comment because uh, she's based in, in Pretoria, but what has been surprising has been the kind of uh, close relations between uh, uh, South Africa and uh, Russia, particularly when one thinks that it might irritate the uh, United States because uh, South Africa has, uh, and the US has, uh, preferential trade agreements with uh, with African countries, for instance, for in terms of the trade, it's uh, extremely important. And uh, 
if this kind of uh, good relations with the U US are, are damaged, uh, the cost will be huge. Also in West Africa, I, I think like countries like Ghana, Nigeria, uh, are very, they have very important uh, ties to US. But, uh, but the United States uh, has, I mean, Africa has always been very remote area and, uh, and uh, the uh, relations, high level, high level relations uh, have gone up and down. So it's not, uh, Africa relations, it's not an important political issue in, in the US. Like it is, for instance, in Europe, not least because of the migration issues and because mm. it is a continent so close to, Exactly. Europe. Yeah. Well, but that's a that's a good reminder. And we are just a continent. So now let's move over to, to African perspective. So so Ayonga, we begin with you. Uh, you already mentioned that Ukraine has been a source of inspiration also for many countries. So what do you think now in the current situations? What the what is the role for different African countries? Can they be actually the game changers of the world order? And if so, how? So please, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, uh, not to give up, I think uh, there has been lots of uh, criticisms about the so-called um, ad hoc based arrangements for policy and guidelines, particularly because um, when you have a lot of these events, uh, there is not uh, sufficient time for different uh, actors to get to build mutual uh, confidence and in, uh, in a way shaping the national level for uh, drafting laws and implementing laws. This has been widely critiqued, but I think the very own um, idea of making it possible through these platforms for different actors to come together and discourse and have open discussions and so on, in a way, it's a, it's, it's, it's a progress in itself. Um, uh, the previous question about uh, the US uh, position, mm -hmm. just, just to quickly mention that because um, Early on, in terms of the previous US leadership, where there was a lot in the media about the uh, US commitment to the Paris uh, uh, to the Paris Agreement in terms of funding uh, projects on climate and also those on biodiversity in Africa, um, with the new uh, US leadership, there has uh, been a change in this. Uh, talking with someone who has been working in the African Union, uh, what we see now. Uh, pretty much linking that to the uh, uh, African Union's uh, climate strategy for 2022, there is this kind of uh, zeal and general interest on different African states working together and having projects that are driven by Africans, African-led projects. But um, this is in itself quite difficult because uh, when you look into each African state and governments, there are also this idea of um, gerontocratic systems, systems that have long been there, so on, and questions about corruption and all of this, and also state monopoly and all of that. Uh, perhaps there's a need for more competition, so that increases quality for investments and more ideas, and more progress and so on. Might be, I might be wrong, but that could be one thing at least based on talking with different experts in Africa. So that would be one area looking forward to how that would develop. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. But we move over to Lisa, maybe to continue on that a little bit. Like there, are, like you mentioned already, that we share a lot of challenges. I mean, Europe and, and Africa, but there are also like so many opportunities. Uh, and the green transition obviously being one of them. So what is your take here? I mean, what what is critical for success, like let's say collaboration between let's say Finnish partners or EU partners and, and African partners, like Ayonga was saying that there is a lot of uh, need and wish for African institutions and, and researchers also to be in the driver's seat. So what should change? How should we work differently? Well, maybe, maybe I will come back to this uh, partnership and uh, respect that we really should develop uh, reciprocal relations. For instance, uh, already 
uh, Finnish uh, business uh, sector sees Africa as an important growing market area with the free trade, world largest uh, free trade area emerging. But uh, it is not only about what we are exporting to Africa. We also need to think, and our business people need to think, what to import from Africa, what, how to invest there. And uh, investments and creation of jobs to young people is also the kind of and free trade, I, I, I would say fair trade. This is, is also an instrument to avoid uh, um, uh, 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 migration that cannot be managed so, and uh, to uh, prevent conflicts uh, from emerging. So this kind of uh, equal reciprocal uh, relations. But also one important issue relates to the continent itself, and that is African Union and the relations between African states. African Union is very weak. The member states are not really committed. Uh, some of them are not even paying their membership fees. So the integration within the uh, continent and uh, making uh, agreements that are really uh, followed is still something we need to see. Uh, the hegemonic big countries, regional countries like uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, they are still in a way uh, uh, deciding of the rules of the game. And it's only smaller states that are promoting uh, the agenda of the African Union. I mean, environmental mm. issues are an interesting uh, example. So there might be areas where the integration is really proceeding, but, uh, but I think that the integration within the continent is, is one key for, for changing the unequal world system as a whole. Well, thank you, Lisa. That was a very good conclusion. And you answered many of my questions that I would have had also on the role of small countries in Africa, integration, world trade system. We soon move over to Ina. Sorry, I will give the floor now to you, Ina. But just before that, uh, uh, Risto, is there anything from your point of view, very briefly to add? And then we will move over to, to Ina. Well, only to, to uh, as a short comment, maybe we should give up talking about development and talk about relations between countries which are on the same level, because the word in itself is kind of post-colonial, giving an idea that we are somehow superior, that we can develop some somebody uh, into something. Okay, that's, that's a great point. Thank you, Risto. So now, Ina, you have been impatiently or patiently waiting for, for the floor. So we are very happy that you would be you were able to join our webinar today. So before I give the floor to you, let me just introduce you briefly. So I'm sure also many of you know Ina Soidi, who is a senior specialist and an educational science counselor uh, and a member of the team Finland Knowledge network working in the embassy of Finland in Pretoria since September 2019, isn't that right? Uh, and many of you know also her role her, from her previous role, which was the executive director of the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, she is a senior expert in development policy, global affairs, specialized in, in African contemporary development. So Ina, the next, let's say eight minutes or so go to you, we would be super keen to hear first your kind of key takeaways from this webinar, but then also based in South Africa, and the country has been mentioned so many times, it's one of the key players in Africa. So please go ahead. What is the role of, of South, South Africa nowadays? So the floor is yours, Ina. Good morning and um, happy Africa Day for everybody. And uh, happy Africa Day actually from Ghana. I, I wanted to show you something, but you can't see it because of the sunlight. Well, there is no sun there, clouds. I'm in the middle of Accra and behind me is one of the symbols of African independence is the, 
the National Theater of uh, of uh, of Ghana, uh, which was established by by or commissioned by the first president of of Ghana. It's a very impressive monument. I'm looking at it and I'm wondering what has happened ever since. Um, I think Ghana and Accra is one of the embodiment of the the decolonization and the independence wave of, of Africa. And we are here actually to, to celebrate uh, African leadership. I belong, apart from what you just said, thank you very much, uh, but I also uh, am a, um, a member of the board of Uongozi Institute, that is an African, a Tanzanian-led and Finnish-supported Leadership Institute for Sustainable Development. And, um, and Uongozi Institute organizes these African leadership forums. And somehow also linked to the theme we are talking, this year the Leadership Forum uh, deals with um, African uh, continental free trade area. You know, their secretariat is here in Accra and, um, and the, the free trade area is one of the organizers. I'm going to rush in nine minutes to, to the <laughs> hall because uh, the presidents are coming. We are, you know, this is a high level thing. So we will have Ghanaian president and uh, also the former president of Tanzania, President Kikwete, who is the patron of Uongosi Institute. But that all said, I think it sets the scene. Um, I was trying, I'm sorry I came late. I opened another webinar um, uh, just before this. And uh, I, you know, I'm really multitasking. While you were talking, I had my breakfast because it's actually 7.50 here in, in Ghana. Yeah, sorry about it. <laughs> no worries, I'm an early, 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 early bird. Um, I wanted a few things which I captured from the from the discussion. I think um, since I'm in Ghana and I'm nostalgic, I think the the old uh, saying of as long as the you know story is, is of the hunter, um, the, the the lion will not get a voice. Um, you you know the saying that uh, this is a, a very much of the, the the truth at the moment, and also in this discussion what we are now having all around the world on the geopolitical situation. We consider Africa again a playing ground for all those big powers you've mentioned during this webinar. And uh, I think that is what irritates the African states most, that we again see everything from the European perspective. I think the Russian attack to Ukraine has made it very clear that issues of conflict become important for the rest of the world when it happens on our own backyard. And I think that is one of the issues what really has made Africa to take this what they call neutral position. And a lot of this so-called uh, pro-Russian attitude is just to be a non-Western. I think somebody said, I think it was Risto who said that um, African countries would not benefit more of being uh, pro-Western in this conflict. They actually want to be non-Western because, I mean, you have all the time the discussions on Iraq and Libya, especially Libya, situations that have not been solved in African continent, the whole struggle for Congo. We mentioned the minerals, the trade. Um, very little has been uh, uh, put attention to African conflicts only when it somehow disturbs the interest of Europe. Um, also, if we look at the Europe, you, you mentioned that what Europe should do more when it comes to African relations and, and better relations with African states. We all know Europe have all these what I call noble ideas to save the world, uh, you know, climate change, move to alternative and, and renewable energy. This is, again, a European perspective. Africa has not caused climate change. Africa has abundant resources that now are sort of forbidden because they threaten um, the, the, the climate and they threaten our, our common survival. So when you always put it in such a way that, you know, now we have to move to renewables because Europe has already, you know, dirtied the whole globe. So then how does it feel? Like you cause a problem, you make us now to fix it. And you tell us this is now what we should do. This is the noble idea. And it's again a European perspective. So this is what really irritates many African states. It doesn't mean they don't understand that we are really threatening our common future, but the solution should happen there where the problems were created. And, and, and we, we, we touched upon, Lisa mentioned about the, 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 the dependence on, on energy resources. South Africa, point, uh, case in point, 
we are in a very interesting situation at the moment because we don't have electricity in South Africa. We don't have power. Sometimes 12 hours a day, we sit in the darkness and we have coal, but we have a very dysfunctional coal power stations. Nobody's willing to invest in them anymore because that's now dangerous. And at the same time, European powers have now uh, bid it for this joint energy transition. Um, and South Africa would be much happier to buy a power from Turkey, which everybody says it cannot happen because it's an environmental catastrophe. I'm not saying that they don't understand the environmental catastrophe. It's just that what is important to provide power for South African people or to think about the whole global. Um, uh, I'm not saying which is important. I'm just saying these are the questions what we talk about the just when we talk about just transition. I also would like uh, briefly to comment on the role of USA. Lisa challenged me. Recent days have been very, very interesting because of this case of possible uh, 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 arms import to Russia. Um, we don't know yet. Uh, uh, it is now the recent situation is that perhaps some South African, private South African companies have actually imported um, uh, the, the, the arms. But it's not known. Somebody surely knows. But U.S. has first time, big, uh, you know, taken it up very, very seriously because this again, like they say, it threatens uh, U.S. American security interest. But I want to conclude by saying, um, very few of us know how how big um, um, role uh, American uh, investors or American de development aid has actually played in developing, for example, the health, the excellent health research in South Africa. We, we all it all comes from HIV AIDS. Again, it started because of of American interest. They invested HIV AIDS research in Amer in in Africa because they threatened. Uh, American people's um, uh, 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 well-being. And uh, um, uh, so what I can only say, what I try to do is to bring up science diplomacy, science collaboration that would give African uh, innov innovative and resilient people to create their own solutions. That's what we are trying to do. And I'm happy that uh, Helsinki University is one of those that have been actively promoting science collaboration. Um, it would be a million other things that I'd like to say, but I think we are done. And I'm so happy that you invited me here. And I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you so much. And have a great Africa day. I'll go and see the presidents now. Ciao, ciao. Good. Okay, lovely. Thank you so much, Ian, and for your brilliant and also very critical words. I think we deserve them. So uh, now we have only two minutes to go. So my final words. As Ina mentioned, at the University of Helsinki, we are indeed very committed towards building partnerships with African countries, and, and we have some amazing programs that we are very proud of that we have co-created some of them together with our partners. So stay in the loop of, of what we are doing. But now I think is the time to really thank our panelists for this excellent discussion. We have recorded it so so those who missed it now can watch it later. But thank you, Lisa Larkso, Risto Marioma, Akonwe Ajonge. It was a big pleasure having you today. So happy Africa Day, everyone. And let's continue the important discussions. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.